morning, everyone. Let's. All right. So we looked at. We've been talking about the web. We've been talking about web technologies. We looked specifically at JavaScript, right? So we know. We've seen that JavaScript is the language of the web in order to interact with pages. And we just saw how actually we can use JavaScript to make asynchronous requests back to the web application, right? the server side code. So now you have the ability of code running on the client, right, sending requests to the server asynchronously without the user knowing, without refreshing the browser. Right? So this is an incredibly powerful technique. And now we can make web applications. We can make web applications that work. We can't make clickers. <laughs> Obviously, I want to connect it to my Mac. Can we make clickers that work? So I'm going to try. Yes. OK. Right? So now this opens up a whole new avenue of building web applications that actually mimic traditional desktop applications. Right? Before this, we'd have to click, and every click refreshes the whole HTML of the page. Right, So not only is it inefficient, because maybe when we click on something, we just wanted to update one little tiny element. Right? We still have to go, we would have to go to the server, get a brand new HTML page, and put the page there. And maybe we could use tricks with frames, where so we have some navigation that doesn't change. Right, So the URL actually doesn't change, but the frame internally is being changed. But here with JavaScript, and this is kind of the web 2.0 um, idea of using asynchronous JavaScript and XML. So we're using Ajax web applications. So now we can write JavaScript code that's running on the browser that responds to clicks and responds to form entries that can potentially go load that data from the server or make a request to the server and then return just that tiny response, only the thing that changed. And so if you actually are interested, really interested in this, from, there's this 2015 uh, essay that actually coined the term Ajax. Questions, JavaScript, web. So it's actually kind of crazy when you think about it, right? So we've looked at binary applications, right? Where's the code to that application that you've been studying live like on the binary server? On disk, yeah, the code's on the disk, and then when you run it, it loads that code in memory and it executes it, right? Here, essentially the code of the application is distributed. Part of it is running on the client's browser, and the other part is running on the server, right? It's actually kind of a crazy different way to think about it. And not only this, you have multiple clients accessing your website in parallel. Each of them are running a different copy of your JavaScript code, right? And you have one kind of central server backend. Um, so it's, it's an interesting, different way of thinking about building an application, right? Because I want to have some functionality on the client. And I don't think we'll get to this, but now it's actually moving more and more to ship the entire application onto the client, right? Instead of, I don't even have, I can actually ask your browser to store your local state on the browser, and I can actually give you an application that runs 100% on your client and doesn't have a server component. So it's like completely inverting the way we kind of traditionally think about the web. Okay. So, right, so we've looked at designing web code, right, designing a web application, coding an application, we've looked briefly at PHP and JavaScript. Um, but how you actually design a web application depends on the framework you use and on the technology, and some of these can be very different. Uh, so CGI applications have one single file that responds to multiple paths. So there's actually one executable that handles this. Um, you can have multiple files each respond to their own path. PHP applications are typically written with files that map one to one with a URL. So usually to access a PHP application, you will go to some the URL, the domain, and the path would be the path in the local file system to that PHP folder. And then the name, the final part of that path would be the name of the PHP application. So this is kind of the traditional way of thinking about web applications was you would write a directory structure of your application and it would mimic the URL structure that you wanted. 
Uh, ASP, classic ASP applications were done the same as, as uh, ASP. And I believe we talked about kind of the natural way of writing PHP code, right? Because PHP lets you mix the output that you want with some code that runs on the server. And so kind of the natural way is you would, you know, get some, you use PHP so the session parameter is PHP's, uh, allows you to do session so it actually, PHP will automatically handle the cookies. And so this way you can store data in the session, it's stored locally. Then we get some username parameter from the URL, and then we check, you know, if this username parameter is not the same as the session username, and the session username is not admin, then say, hey, you can't view this, you can only view comments. Otherwise, get the session, and then we can, so we can look at a page like this. Um, so, you know, this would be like kind of like a classic, um, authorization check in PHP, you would do this for the start of your PHP file, right? But look, I'm like doing a check and outputting HTML content in the same file, right? Wouldn't it like a better software engineering approach be some way that I could like abstract this check out and I could say on these PHP files, this check has to pass Otherwise, they can't access these files, right? This way, I write my authorization code in one place and one place only, as opposed to distributing it in every PHP file that I want. And maybe, like, in the fact that I'm outputting HTML right in the middle of an authorization check, it's also kind of crazy, right? What if I want to change this and use this as a JSON endpoint for a mobile application, right? I don't want to spit back HTML, I want to spit back a JSON object. Uh, more natural ways to do this is, let's say I have this comment page, I am welcoming some user, I have some debug information, and I'm outputting the comments. So how do I want to get these comments? So this is actually uh, an example from a homework assignment I created when I was a TA at UC Santa Barbara for an undergrad security class. And so the way I did this, this was me, like I'm a web programmer, I'm <laughs> developing this PHP application, right? I need to get the comments, so I open, I use SQLite, so I'm not using MySQL, but I use SQLite, I open what is a local file, I select from comments where username is the username parameter, and then I get the result, and I loop over this result, and I output HTML mixed with the output of, with, from the database. <coughs> and so, this is actually a very natural way of how PHP really evolved. It's like, well, this is how you do it, right? Because everything that's not in the tag is gonna be output. It's essentially kind of like templating, right? But is this like a sustainable way to write a large application? What if there's somewhere else in the program that I wanted to get the comments from the database for a specific username? What if I wanted to do that, but then change the way they're output, right? What if I didn't want to use p tags, I wanted to use something else? Right, but here I'm embedding the logic of my application, right, with the generation of the output in a way that's honestly insane when you think about scaling this up to a large application. And so the form of this would say, so continuing on with this code, the form of this would say to add a comment, you make an action here, we put the username in here, uh, we have the text form, so I have to make sure that I'm properly passing in the value I want in the text field. I also have a comment name, uh, a comment, a text area, which gives me the box in a form. And then I still have to have my check of if there was some error, right, I tried to get something from the database, all the way at the end here, I have to have my error check of what happens if there was an error. I have to say that there's some error message. So hopefully you've been programming long enough at this point that you look at this and you're kind of like viscerally disgusted. Like, this is not the way how to write an application, right? In a maintainable, sustainable way. It's like, oh God, you have these checks and then you have like, You're making database queries like halfway down the PHP page. Like, how would you even know? If you wanted to, let's say there's a performance problem with this page, right? You want to say, well, what's the problem, right? Where are all my database queries? Well, they're in every single PHP file of my application. 
So I have to look for all of the, whatever, the SQL query, what do I have here? What do I call it? The SQL-like query. I have to look for all of those types of instances, look for all the queries that are being passed in to see if I'm maybe not using an index or I should be using an index. All this kind of stuff, right? Which really database, like the database is really just mapping data, right? From the database into my program, right? I want to be able to say, hey, give me all of the user's comments. But instead, I am on demand when I'm, um, when I need the comments, I am just querying the database and looping over that and outputting the comments. So I should say I'm not like shaming all PHP programmers, I am also shaming myself. This is how, this is a very natural style of how to use PHP. And this was my, me personally, I, I mean, I wrote code that looked very, very, very similar to this. And so it really gets into like, so what does spaghetti code mean? I mean, spaghetti is delicious, right? So why do we call it spaghetti? It's kind of, maybe it's a compliment? What does it mean when we talk about spaghetti code? Somebody want to take a crack at it? You have to define it. I'm not gonna, yeah. Tangled. Tangled. Yeah, it's a good way, right? It's like tangled. It's like you can't, you look at one strand, you look at a bowl of spaghetti and you look at one strand, you'd be like, where does this strand go? Who knows, right? You have to pull that strand out, which is kind of like debugging. And then you're left with the thousands of other strands of spaghetti that are in there, which who knows what they're doing or how they're related, right? And software is actually probably even, more, now that I think about it, is more confusing than spaghetti because all the strands are actually separate, so you could just keep pulling them out one by one. Whereas in software, it's all like tied together and sometimes it's like mashed together. Um, maybe your strands aren't even uniform lengths, maybe the lengths change, I, I don't know, man, software's crazy. So, yeah, so you wanna change how comments are stored, right? Let's, we wanna give extra metadata to comments. Well, how do I know all the places in my code that touch comments? Because I've written every single file in my application like this where it's just queries spread throughout. Right? So you have to change every single SQL query in every single PHP file that touches comments, as well as the way comments are output. So it becomes just a crazy mess, and the HTML output intermixed with SQL queries, intermixed with PHP code. Oh, just so glad that we've moved away from this as a community. Right? And kind of, a, yes, please. Another problem. If you have a requirement to create like standalone desktop application, you cannot share your model. No, you can't share anything, right? You write everything. Yeah. If you wanted to, even I mean, uh, I would say I'd probably argue a little bit that like most people don't want to move a web application to a desktop application. What they want to do is they want to provide a uh, mobile application for their web application, right? So now, now you basically have to have two different code bases, right? The PHP application that generates HTML. You try to develop a new PHP application that uses the same database that has a JSON or REST endpoint, right? That that's what the mobile site would talk to. And I have to make sure those code, that code is in sync. Exactly, right? Now you're duplicating code, so you bug your how you're doing. Oh, God. <laughs> Shivers. Another problem, right, is we're technically coupling the URLs that we want to access to the scripts, right? In that previous example, Right? Here my form action was add underscore comment dot PHP because there just happened to be a file on the server called add underscore comment dot PHP. But who cares that it's actually a P what if I want to change this later to ASP.net or Ruby on Rails or something, right? I mean, does the client care that they're actually accessing a PHP script? No. Like, hey, aesthetically it's super ugly. Right? Like, why would you want to tell people the way your program's built? Um, and from an engineering point, right, we're technically coupling the URLs in our application to these scripts. So what if I want to refactor and move that add comment file to somewhere else? Like, what if I want to change from add comments to slash comments slash add.php? Right? It's a little bit more clean. But now, what about people who are linking to add comments.php, right? I have to make sure that I provide some redirect or some other functionality to support that. And so this is the very natural way. When you first start doing this, this is very natural. Is I want to map URLs to scripts that get executed, right? And a one-to-one -one mapping. So that if we do like this, example.com, add comments or view comments, 
users view users, right? All these map directly to this file structure. So we tell the web server, hey, this is my folder for my PHP application, and it looks, it knows exactly how to map, okay, in the root folder, there should be an add underscore comment.php file here. Right? But do we have to do this? Is there anything that in the spec, the HTTP that says that we have to do it like this? No, right? All that it says is we need to be able to access a resource, ask for a resource, something happens and it returns some HTML. Right? So this is so this is kind of like getting you into the mindset of programming and web programming uh, around the time that Ruby on Rails was first released. Uh, so anybody code in Rails at any point? Oh man, very small number. Um, it's actually kind of fine because a lot of the ideas from Rails have spread into pretty much every single web development language. So it's, it's actually kind of hard to convey, at least personally to me, the kind of like aha moment when I first like played with Rails. It was like this completely rethinking the way you develop your web application and you can see immediately that like, oh, this is clearly a better way. Like the way we've been doing it before is crap. Um, and actually, even just using the ideas from here, you can now write, I mean, people write PHP code that follows these kind of conventions and this way. So you can actually write maintainable, good PHP code. The problem is the vast majority of PHP code tend towards crap, right? It's used so much, so. And the key idea here was the model view controller paradigm. So it's basically like, and I'm, how many have heard of this before? Okay, good portion, so it should be reviewed, cool. And this is actually an idea from user interface design, right? So the idea is, if you have some GUI, some interface, do you want to like actually put the code that happens when you click the button, like with the same thing that draws the button and how the button looks like? No, that's crazy, right? Then if you want to design a new GUI or change things, right, you're tightly coupled there. So the idea was we wanted to separate the concerns of a GUI, right? So we had some model. So the model is the data of our system, right? The state of our system. We have some model and that's separate from how we display that model in a GUI, right? So the view is how, how does it look, right? Just how does it look like? And the controller is the thing in the middle that manages between. So it says, okay, you click this button, that means I need to update this thing from the model and here's your new view, right? So the business logic should be in the controller and the model stores the state of your system, and the view handles how everything actually looks. Uh, so it was actually originally created in the early 90s, um, and it was popularized by Ruby on Rails to structure basically server-side code of web applications. And so kind of the way you can think about this is like the model basically updates the view or the controller like manipulates the model, right? Puts things in databases. Uh, the user actually sees the view and interacts with the controller, and then the controller will update, change the model, which will update the view, and you get this nice cycle. Um, so in the web, the idea is that the model handles all the business logic. So everything that's important is, of the logic of the application is handled by, oh wait, by the model. Okay, yes, that makes sense, right. Um, and it stores the application state. So it does all the validation that you need before data comes in. It does all of the important things that you want your application to do. The view is responsible for generating the view of the user data from the model. So it basically says like, okay, if I get comments, here's how comments look, right? And if you want to access the comments page, here's how the comments page looks. And maybe I can even use little bits, like I can use the view that does comments in my view that does the comments page, right? So there I'm reusing logic. And it's usually in a very simple templating system. Some people even do like non-Turing complete languages for the templating system um, to display the data. So this actually goes back to, it's kind of funny because this is pretty much what PHP is, right? PHP is like an incredibly simple thing. It's kind of going to be thought of as a templating system, right? Like the page should look like this and replace these values with something dynamic, which is what a templating system does. But the problem is, is when you're doing it just in a templating system, where do you do the model and the controller, all those other logics? The controller is basically responsible for, takes the input from the user, fetches the correct data from the model, and calls the correct view. 
So now the great thing about this, right, is I can have different views for different clients. Weird sound. Um, I can have different views for different clients, right? So if you're accessing on a web browser, the controller can know that, and it can say, okay, great, here's the HTML view, right? Getting the same data. Or if you come from to a REST endpoint, I can access the same data, but use the JSON view. So I'll pass JSON data back to you. Um, this way, you're separating these concerns. Um, obviously, it needs to be different depending on what output you're giving, right? I mean, the code for that has to be different. But where that data is stored, that model is still the same, and your checks on authorization, all that kind of stuff should be the same for both. Now, the controller should be very simple. Uh, so this was one big thing that Ruby on Rails introduced. The other incredibly important thing was we call object relational mapping. So the idea is in our programming languages, we deal with objects, right? Java, even PHP has objects now, right? Ruby especially, actually in Ruby it's kind of crazy, everything is an object, um, even like numbers, right? But the database is relational and doesn't really have any concepts of objects, right? We have to issue queries to the database to basically get data back and iterate over those results. Um, so the idea with object relational mapping is, well, programmers are used to using objects, so why don't we let them use objects to interact with the database and essentially abstract away and not have the programmer worry about SQL? And based on how you access these objects, I will go and fetch whatever data you need from the database and give it back to you. Um, so Rails has active record, which you can do cool things like so user would be your model. You can say user.create, so it's gonna create a new entry in your database with the name of David and an occupation of code artist. This is from the Rails uh, tutorial, or either the tutorial or the documentation, so. I don't know, is there David in here who's a code artist? Uh, this is from the guy who created Rails is David, I can never remember the middle name or last name, but is he? Yeah, DHH, that's what I remember. Is Heather Meyer, I don't know, I'm not gonna do it. I'll mess it up. And so I can query the database by using the model, the user, and I can say, hey, find every user with the name, find a user with the name David. And it will see no SQL, right? I don't have to worry about SQL. I can actually treat this as an incredibly dumb backend. And the beauty is, is I can switch between SQLite or MySQL or Postgres, right, without ever changing my code. Right? Because what it's actually using to store the data, who cares? And I can destroy David because I'm strong. <laughs> I can do complex queries too. I can look for articles whose ID is greater than 10, and I can limit that to 20, and I can order by ID ascending. Right? So these are actually parts of normal SQL queries. Right? And I can chain these, and the cool thing is, I guess I shouldn't go into a ton of detail, but uh, the cool thing is when you start playing with this, is the ORM layer, this object relational mapping, is actually lazy loading the results for you. So when you first call article.where ID is greater than 10, it doesn't actually issue that query for all articles in the database greater than 10. Right? That could be a lot. Then when we call .limit 20, then it knows, okay, now if I use it, I'm gonna limit you to 20. And then if I wanna order, now it'll actually do the order. So it actually doesn't use this until we ask for or iterate over the results there. Uh, it's actually really cool and very powerful. Okay, so one thing was model view controller, the other one was object relational mapping. The third one is routing. So this is dealing with the problem of coupling URLs to um, files, basically. And the idea was, okay, let's define a mapping between URLs and server-side functions. Right? So now it's really cool, instead of having an entire file, right, completely different files for different endpoints, now I can say, hey, when you go to users, you know, comments slash view, execute this view comments method. And that method handles, is the part of the controller that handles that. Um, and you can also define what parameters get passed to that function. So this will automatically handle the get parameters to parameters of your function. Right? It's a lot easier to reason about a function if it takes in parameters rather than just getting parameters from the local variables like in PHP. So for instance, on Rails, I can make a book controller and it subclasses application controller and I can define a method of the book controller called update. 
So this would be how to update a book, right? Like I've checked out a book or something, or I need to edit the title. And actually, so one of the drawbacks to Rails is that a lot of things happen magically. So by default, it's been a while since I've actually done hardcore Rails programming. Uh, but by default here, because books controller subclasses applications controller, it means you actually don't have to manually create the route. It will automatically create a route for slash, I think books, maybe books or book, slash update to this method. So it will actually do that automatically for you because it knows that this is a method that was implemented in a subclass of application controller. It's actually one of the big drawbacks of Rails is that it just does magic stuff. And so it's hard to actually understand what's going on. Okay, so we can find a book, so we can use our model. So book is our model. We're gonna find by the ID parameter that was sent in. We will set that to, it's been a while, but at people done Ruby, is this the, this means a class variable of books controller, is that right? Yeah. yeah, okay. So the reason why we do this is this way the view can automatically get this, access this book class instance variable. I can't remember what it's called in Ruby. And we can check, we can call book.update, so we're updating our model with the book parameters, whatever parameters we get sent in. If that's true, then we can redirect to book. So this is actually kind of crazy. We can redirect automatically to our model, so this will know how to turn this model instance into like slash, it'll be probably slash book slash view slash one, or whatever the ID of that book is. Otherwise, we can render edit, so we can show the edit page if that update didn't work for whatever reason. So now here, right, this controller is incredibly simple. It's just updating things, fetching things. Uh, and so we can look, we can define an index. So this is what happens when we go to like slash books. It would just get all books from the database. And then the templating system comes in to actually display all those books. So this templating system is the view part. And this is a simplified language which the input can be either variables or dictionaries. Um, and the outputs can be anything you want. It can be either HTML, JSON, XML, whatever new, you do protocol buffers, I guess, if you're talking about like uh, a Google service. And Ruby on Rails by default uses ERB. Uh, what does ERB stand for? Embedded Ruby. Embedded Ruby. What's the B though? I think it's Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> If it's clever, if they made it clever though, then I feel bad for making fun of them. Okay, um, yeah, so Ruby uses ERB, and so this way it's kind of like PHP, it looks everything not within special tags, it's just HTML output. And then we can use these tags to say, hey, for each of the books that we define in our controller, right, do this block of things, and we're passing the parameter book here. Uh, Ruby is a little bit of weird syntax if you're not intimately familiar with this. But this is looping over every book and setting a local, param, uh, local variable book to whatever element we're iterating over. So I can do things like I can have a row, and then here I'm outputting a book title, I'm outputting a book content, I'm making a link to the show, met, uh, I'm making a link to an individual book with the text of show. This will link to edit, and it will link to the edit book path of book and we can remove a book, and we can do all crazy kind of stuff, like uh, we can set, here we're setting the method, so this actually sets the HTTP method of this, uh, whatever happens here, uh, when we click this, and it will actually try to conf pop up a confirmation dialog. So this is actually kind of cool, because Rails will automatically write the JavaScript code to handle all this, yes? I believe it's being interpreted, like interpreted as a theme. Uh, oh, uh, yes, um, I'm actually not really familiar with Also, um, like C sharp with uh, XAML kind of like layouts and stuff, you can do similar things here. You can link things, and yeah, that's actually a whole other thing. But but yeah, so the idea is is with Rails, they're like, okay, well, programmers are developing the same applications over and over, right? You have to do these things. You have to render HTML content. You have to talk to a database, and so they said, well, well let's provide a platform, a library for people to actually do that. And so, okay, so that's kind of a like, brief introduction to kind of like more modern web application frameworks. 
so that you can see that you can't always assume, I see this URL, I know exactly which code is being executed on the back end, right? There's a mismatch there. And when you're looking at it from the outside, you may not be able to tell. Um, and so one of the crazy things is that in the web ecosystem, right, we talked about make an HTTP request, the web server handles that request, it forwards it to the web application, it does some processing, it returns a result, and then we make an HTTP response. Uh, but actually, modern web applications are actually much more complex, right? Modern web applications, I may make a request to one server, right? That back end may then make other requests to other web servers, which then go fetch different web applications that they're using, and then may send a response back. Like for instance, um, if we think about like, uh, let's say advertisements, right? So I make a request to, let's say, CNN.com. Uh, it's not exact, well, do they do this? Yeah, right? So it's generating the, this, let's say, the home page, but it also wants to include an ad, right? So CNN has a relationship with an ad library. So they may ask that what ad library, hey, I'm about to send this request, what ad should I include? Right? And that's going to execute a whole bunch of other things that happen on the ad library, on the ad library backend, right? It could also be a different scenario where I make a request to the server, it sends me back some content, and then I make a new request to a new server based on the JavaScript code that gets in, inserted to actually make a request to a different server, right? So this would be like in the Google Ads. So if you want to use Google Ads on your website, you include a snippet of JavaScript code. So this means when you view this page, your browser automatically goes and fetches this new page from this new domain. Uh, it could be even crazier. We can have like the web application backend itself may make other requests to other services, right? And those could make whatever requests they want before finally returning an HTML content. And we can also have different copies of browsers, right? How many people browse with only one tab open? I'm gonna say you're monsters. Uh, if you see my tabs, I usually have 10 to 50 tabs open at any one time, right? So I have like multiple copies of Firefox running and they're all interacting with different web applications and different websites. So, right, part of the key is what we're going to talk about now, now we're getting into the security things. So. This seems crazy, right? We saw that not only is code being executed on each of these servers, right, that are running who knows what language, doing who knows what, but they're also sending code to my browser that's also being executed by my computer. Did I write that code? No. Did I validate that that code is correct and free of errors or bugs? No, right? I'm just getting code from a website and your browser actually automatically executes that code. Does this seem great from a security perspective? I mean, we've been learning about all the problems, right? Yeah, it's just nuts. So part of the problem is who's secure? So when we talk about web security, what do we need, right? Well, whose security do we care about, right? So do we care about the web application security? Yes, why? Because they provide all these HTML uh, pages, all these applications to all these clients. So if that becomes compromised, then every single person who tries to use it also gets compromised because of that. Hmm. I agree. But I want you to think about more of, let's say this is the IRS's website, the web server, right? Do I care to compromise other people who are visiting that website? What would I really want as an attacker? Let's start, we gotta start thinking offensively, right? We're an attacker, we find a moment, we wanna attack maybe the web server of the IRS. What does that allow us to do? Say like 
we, we don't have to pay any taxes this year. Yeah, you could like alter all your tax records, right? Because fundamentally, maybe not this server, but maybe this server, right? Somebody has to have access to the database, right? I mean, if we're able to access it through the web application, fundamentally that means some part of the application has to access that database, right? So what if I trick this database to access like your tax records? I guess tax records are kind of boring. Let's talk about a bank, right? A bank. If I can trick the web application to send money from your account to my account, would I like that? Yes, that'd be pretty sweet. I'd turn it into some Bitcoin and you'd have a fun end of the semester where I would be here. <laughs> right? So we care about the security of the server, right? And the web application backend, right? Because the web application backend has all the logic of the application. Any data that the web application can touch <coughs> is data that if there's a vulnerability in that web application, Right? Just like we saw with binaries. We got that binary to execute arbitrary code. Right? If we can get this web application, this web application here, right, to execute arbitrary code, wow, we're it's, it's game over, right? We can do whatever that web application can do. Right? And that includes we could steal the data, we could alter the data, we could exfiltrate the data, we could just delete the data. Oh, I didn't send you guys that link. Uh, there's a great link. Well, not great, poor guy. A uh, guy accidentally ran rm-rf slash on all of his machines, and he <coughs> wiped out like a thousand customers' dad websites. And the really sad part is he was also running that same command on his um, backup machines. So all the backups also got deleted. So what about here? What about on my browser? Do I care about the security here? What? And what do I care about? What do you care about here? Somebody said yes, so why? I mean, if somebody controls the server, but so if we just flip the model here, you could get access to my bank records that are on my computer. Right, yeah, I'm taking code from a random server. Do you actually know that when you type in so when you type in google.com, you're reasonably certain that you're talking to Google. But you click on one of those links. Do you know, how many of you have been searching for programming answers and you just like click on any link <laughs> that could possibly get like you, I, I know the thought process is I do it too. You're like, okay, I hope there's a Stack Overflow answer. Or I hope there's a Stack Overflow post and I hope there's an answer to that post. Uh, if there's not, then I have to start like digging through all these terrible search results. And you're constantly just clicking and opening up things in your browser, right? And fundamentally, your browser is then executing code by random people and organizations that you have no idea. You don't know whether these are good people or bad people, right? We looked at we looked at the architecture of the web. There's no boss or traffic cop that says like, no, this is a bad site, right? You cannot visit this site, right? And so yeah, we care. What happens if I visit a really bad site? Are they able to steal my cookies for my bank, right? My session information for me and my bank, right? How many of you use the uh, remember password feature of your browser? Some of you? I use LastPass, so I'm not judging, uh, right? So if I visit a malicious site, can that site read all of my stored passwords? Because that's all I need to get into a website, right? I just need username and password. Or maybe I need your cookie, right? If I get your cookie, then I can impersonate you on the session. So, what we're going to look at first is exactly how does, what does the browser do to try to ensure the security of accessing completely different sites and executing random JavaScript code from those sites, right? Seems absolutely outrageous. Okay, but first we're going to look at frames really quick. So frames that we talked about, we can basically put multiple separate URLs together on one page. And so it was used in the early days to provide like a banner or a navigation element so you wouldn't have to keep refreshing that. If you still go to, I'm sure there's some professors out there who still have like terrible frame-based websites that are horrible to use. Because uh, I know because I've experienced that myself. I'm not commenting on any professors here at our <laughs> fine university. Uh, I mean generally, I've seen that a lot. Okay. 
So we use a frame set to say, so there's a frame set tag, and it says, okay, I want 85% of it, oops, I want 85% of it to be frame 1.html, 15% uh, to be frame 2.html, and if, there, if the browser does not support frames because your browser is, I don't know, Internet Explorer 1 or something, <laughs> uh, then output this text. And so if we have inside frame 1.html, I am frame 1, and in frame 2, we have I am frame 2, then when we load this up, right, the URL here says frames.html, and we can see that the left frame is I am frame one, and it's 85% of the screen, and then 15% of the screen is I am frame two. Right, so these are two different URLs essentially being composed into one page. Think about that. There's nothing that says these URLs have to be to the same endpoint. These URLs could be arbitrary. These are just URLs, right? So these could point to anything. Okay, iframes are a step above in that it's not, you don't have this visual separator here. It's not entirely clear that it actually is separate frames. Uh, so we can use iframes to specify frames here. And then it will look like this. So it looks actually completely transparent to us, the user, that they're using frames. But this is crazy, right? I can just put random stuff together. Like what happens if I include like your bank account, chase.com here, and my malicious page here? Right? These are both JavaScript, like they can both have JavaScript, they're both executing. What the hell? Right? What about JavaScript code that's executing in your in your browser with the different tabs? Right? What's happening in each of these different tabs? And so fundamentally, so when we talk about, we're going to talk, we're going to get, we will get to the, uh, the back end, uh, the applications level vulnerabilities. But to get there, we really need to understand this is actually the key security feature of the web. Uh, the whole idea of JavaScript, right, is browsers are constantly <coughs> downloading and running foreign code, often concurrently, right? So this coming from all over the place. We just saw with frames, those things are happening at the same time, tabs, right? So one thing that should freak you out is, dear God, I don't want people to be running arbitrary code on my machine. I have all my documents, I have all your guys' grades, I have everything, right, on my computer, all my photos. Like, good God, can a random website access those photos? Right, so A, we should not want that, right? Bad, 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 bad. Uh, so first, okay, so the first kind of step to JavaScript security is what's called a sandboxing mechanism. So a sandboxing mechanism says, okay, you're actually not allowed, so you cannot touch local files. There's absolutely no way to write a JavaScript application using JavaScript that touches local files. Okay, good. Um, you can't actually access most network resources. Right? You can't just normally make a socket request to somebody else. Right? Then you can play weird socket-based games. Like you can't create JavaScript code that runs in the browser that listens to a socket and tries to sniff network traffic. Right? That would be bad. Uh, this actually used to be a huge problem. I don't know if everybody remembers browsing the web before tabs. You would have like pop-ups and stuff would create windows that were like really small and tiny that you couldn't actually get rid of. So you couldn't make small windows with JavaScript. You can't uh, access, by default, the browser's history. So why is this good? Cookies. Cookies? Uh, so actually, we'll, we will get to that in just a second. But even without cookies, so let's say they can't access your cookies, do you want every website you go to to be able to tell all the other sites you've ever visited? No. Why not? What was it? They can send like adverts and stuff. Yeah, like for privacy reasons, right? Like we don't talk about, we're not gonna talk about much about privacy, but that's a big reason, right? I, you know, fundamentally, A, well, A, the HTTP protocol, right? I don't tell people where I've been when I make a request. I don't even tell that server that I've been there unless they've set a cookie, right? But think about if every website you visited sent JavaScript code to query every single site that you've ever visited, right? I could learn probably a lot 
about you, right? Yes, so privacy reasons, right? The specific details of every sandbox depend on the browser. So they are slightly different, but they all do most of these things. So the absolutely, so if there's only one thing you take away from this section of the class on web security, it needs to be the same origin policy. The same origin policy is the absolute most important thing to web security. Because this defines how does JavaScript uh, talk to other JavaScript, right? I'm executing concurrently all this JavaScript code, right? And this JavaScript code, right, can change the HTML, change the look of, of a page, right? So why doesn't, when you visit one site, how come it doesn't change the HTML in another tab? Or when I visit things in frames, can they? change each other's content? What about cookies, right? JavaScript can access cookies. So can we? Can JavaScript that I go to malicious.com, can that access a cookie from Chase? We would want it to be no, but the question is why and how does the browser decide? So this is what comes back to the same origin policy. So this is a standard security policy for JavaScript across all browsers, and the idea is Okay, yes, you only learned one thing. So every frame or tab in a browser's window is associated with a domain, right? That content came from somewhere, from some URI, URL, right? And so domain here is same origin policy domain. So this is not necessarily the domain name, although we'll see that's a component. So the idea is the tuple protocol domain port from where the frame or page was downloaded is the same origin. It defines the domain of that code, right? So that code downloaded in a frame can only access resources associated with that frame. So this is specifically what means that when I go to badguy.com, mm -hmm. right, I can't access google.com's cookies or anything because they do not have the same origin. Right? Their three tuple is different. This actually also means if you visit the same site on a different port, it, the JavaScript also can't access each other. Okay, the one caveat to this, and this is also an incredibly important nuance here, is we saw that we can include external code, right? As we can use a script tag, we can use the source attribute, and we can specify an arbitrary URI. So, if we explicitly include external code, that code executes with the same origin policy within that domain of the code that included it, or of the page that included it, right? So this is why, so on my website, right? My website, if you go to the website, it has the domain, uh, the protocol <coughs> is HTTP, the domain is adamdupay.com, and the port is 80, right? That is the same, that, the same origin policy domain. On there, I include a script to jQuery because we saw, uh, I'm gonna phrase it differently, but jQuery is awesome and everything else is terrible. That's the way I'll say it. Right, so th what this means is that jQuery, right, when even though this is in a different domain, different same origin policy domain, right, this is gonna be HTTPS, ajax.googleapis.com, and then port what? 443, oh, right, oh, the oh, HTTPS oh. port, exactly, right? It should be different, but because I'm explicitly using it in a script tag, it will execute in the same origin of my page. Okay. Can you somehow like fix this tuple? No, not explicitly. This is the main way to get around it, okay. with this guy here, right? Um, okay, we're gonna stop on this, but please, 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 same origin policy, incredibly important. Incredibly important. Don't tell somebody to take a web security class and you don't know the same word policy. <laughs>